Let me get into um, uh, the topic for this morning called Evangelism and the Defense of the Faith by simply saying that, at least in part, the procedure I, I hope to follow today is going to be very close to the procedure in one aspect, to the procedure followed by um, the Apostolic Church. That is, their church services were quite different from what we have today as a church service. Uh, there was always a sermon, of course. But after the sermon, there was a question and answer period. And they entertained questions. Their idea was to teach. They, they did not simply get up and give a monologue, and everybody sings a hymn and goes home. Uh, they put the emphasis on teaching. And one teaches best in a question and answer format. Uh, for instance, if you read the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, you will see, for instance, that women are forbidden to ask questions in public meetings. Uh, men are not forbidden to ask questions. Uh, now this is a, a characteristic of the apostolic church. They encouraged people to learn and they entertained questions uh, during their teaching. So if during the course of my talk you have questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, I would only ask that you distinguish between two types of questions. Uh, one is a question for clarity. If, if you don't understand something I've said, uh, be sure to ask me uh, what uh, I can do to clear up something that I've said. The other is a question of disagreement. And I suspect there might be some disagreement, although I don't know. Uh, but ask the clarification questions first. Make sure you understand what I've said uh, before uh, we get into the disagreement. Okay, let's go ahead then with evangelism and the defense of the faith. The proper relationship between evangelism and the defense of the faith can't be grasped until some very elementary ideas are understood. In better, more spiritual ages, these ideas would have been thoroughly understood by those who profess to be Christians. But in this 20th century, which likes to think it is enlightened, but is actually in darkened, it is necessary to return to the elementary things. After 2,000 years of Bible study, most of those who profess to be Christians in America in the 20th century do not know what the gospel is. I can attribute this only to the curse of God on this generation and this nation. The author of Hebrews acidly criticized his readers for their ignorance. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, he wrote, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Since this excoriation was written in the first century A.D., how much more needs to be said 19 centuries later? In a sense, Americans are worse off than the Hebrews, for we have teachers who think they know a great deal and do not. The arrogance of our teachers is the arrogance of ignorance. At least the Hebrews were not, and did not pretend to be, teachers. The elementary ideas that must be understood before we can deal competently with the relationship between evangelism and apologetics are the gospel, the faith, and defense. What is the gospel? What is the faith? And what is defense? Everyone knows that the root of the word evangelism means good news. Therefore, evangelism means telling the good news. But what is the good news? What is the gospel? Let me begin by explaining what the gospel is not. The gospel is not, you must be born again. The gospel is not, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. The gospel is not, you must be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The gospel is not, you must speak in tongues. The gospel is not, you can perform miracles. The gospel is not, you must be saved. The gospel is not, let Jesus into your heart. The gospel is not, you must have a personal relationship with Christ. The gospel is not, repent. The gospel is not, expect a miracle. The gospel is not, Jesus set an example for us so that we may follow him to heaven. The gospel is not, trust Jesus. The gospel is not, let go and let God. The gospel is not, draw nigh unto God. The gospel is not, Christ died for all men and desires the salvation of all. The gospel is not, decide for Christ. The gospel is not, Christians should take dominion over the earth. 
the gospel is not Jesus is coming again. All these messages, and presumably many more that I have neither heard nor thought of, are being preached from American pulpits as the gospel. Some of them are true. Some are taken from scripture. But none of them is the gospel. Not everything in the Bible is the gospel. Some of it is law, for example. The gospel is good news. But the gospel is good news of a particular sort. It is not good news about what Christians will enjoy in heaven. It is not good news about what God can do in changing your life. Many people confuse the gospel with stories about what God has done in their lives. They make the same mistake that the 70 disciples did, as Luke reports in chapter 10. Let me repeat this story. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Here were seventy men who could perform genuine miracles. God was doing wonderful things in their lives. They had dominion even over demons. They were reconstructing society. But Jesus tells them explicitly, do not rejoice in this. They were confusing what God was doing in their own experience with what he had done from all eternity and with what Christ was going to accomplish on the cross. They were rejoicing in their subjective experience. But God told them to rejoice in something that they had never experienced, something that God had done wholly outside of them even before they were born. Yet most of what are called evangelical books, essays, and sermons today consist of little else but stories about the wonderful things that God is doing in this movie star's life, or that football player's life, or what he can do in your life. They do not contain even the least suggestion of the gospel. I cannot overemphasize this point. Virtually all of what is preached from the pulpits of America, in conservative as well as liberal churches, is not the gospel. It is a clever counterfeit, and millions of churchgoers are being cheated. The Apostle Paul tells us very clearly what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. And that gospel is preached in very few so-called Christian churches today. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There are several aspects of Paul's gospel that need emphasis. First, the gospel concerns history. It does not concern the future nor the present. The gospel does not concern any present or future action God or man might take. Second, and more specifically, it concerns the actions of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago actions that are wholly outside of our experience. Just as all men are condemned by Adam's sin, which was wholly outside of us, so are all the elect saved by Christ's obedience unto death, which is wholly outside of them. Third, the gospel concerns what Christ did for his people. Christ died for our sins, not the sins of the whole world, but for the sins of his people. He came to save some, and he actually earned salvation for them. He did not come to offer salvation to all men, but to accomplish salvation for some men. The gospel is an objective message. Sanctification, the new birth, faith, the second coming, are all consequences of what Christ accomplished 2,000 years ago in Judea. They must not be confused with the gospel any more than effects should be confused with causes.
But there is more in Paul's account of the gospel than might appear in a superficial reading. Even the superficial reading that I have just given will be enough to send some professed Christians into apoplectic shock. But that it, there is a great deal more. Paul uses the phrase, according to the scriptures, twice in this concise account of the gospel. His whole account of the gospel takes only 27 words in the New King James Version, and fewer in the Greek, and eight of them are according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. The phrase is obviously very important. Why does Paul repeat it? What does it mean? The gospel, according to Paul, is embedded in something much larger. It is embedded in the scriptures. Not only are the scriptures the only reliable source of information we have about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but the scriptures alone explain them. The gospel is not merely that Christ died. So did Paul. The gospel is not merely that he was buried. So was Abraham. The gospel is not merely that he rose again, so did Lazarus. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is in accord with and explained by the scriptures, all 66 books of them. The verses surrounding the two I have quoted from 1 Corinthians 15 explain the background of the gospel. Paul did not invent it, he received it and he received it from Christ himself. The surrounding verses also begin to explain what the effect of the gospel is, by which also you are saved. The verses following explain the historical evidence for the resurrection. By emphasizing the phrase according to the scriptures, Paul is emphasizing the fact that the gospel is part of a system of truth given to us in the Bible. All of its parts fit together. They are all consistent. The specific propositions called the gospel do not stand alone. They imply and are implied by many others. The choosing of God the Father, the choosing by God the Father of those that should be saved, the actual atonement for their sins by God the Son at Calvary, and the gift of faith to the elect by God the Holy Spirit are all part of the system of truth taught in the Bible. They are the three great aspects of redemption, election, atonement, and faith. And the gospel, the doctrine of the atonement, is the central theme. It is impossible to defend the gospel or even to preach the gospel without defending and explaining the system of truth of which it is a part. Paul's emphatic phrases here in 1 Corinthians 15 indicate that those who wish to separate the gospel from the system of truth found in the Bible cannot do so. The gospel, while a distinct part of the biblical system, is nevertheless a part of the system. The system is fully expressed in the scriptures. The propositions that Paul calls the gospel are some of the propositions of scripture. Because the gospel is part of the scriptural system of truth, it is impossible to defend the gospel without defending the system. This emphasis upon the scriptures, the writings, is not unique to Paul. If you would recall Christ's temptation, each time the devil tempted him, Christ quoted scripture in reply. It is written. What makes this more significant is the context in which it occurred. Christ had just been baptized. He had heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit had descended on him in the form of a dove. Talk about religious experiences. Talk about testimonies. Why didn't Christ tell the devil what had happened to him? Voices from heaven and the whole works. Why did he quote what many today call the dead letter? Why does he defend the faith by quoting scripture rather than recounting his experiences? Take Peter as another example. Why does he unfavorably compare eyewitness testimony and voices from heaven with the writings? In his second letter he says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter had just written that 
God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us. Later in the same chapter, he says that scripture is the only way we have of getting this knowledge. The scripture, the prophetic word made more sure, is the light that shines in a dark place. Not a brightly lit place, nor even a dimly lit place, but a dark place. There is no other source for this knowledge, including knowledge of the gospel, than the scriptures. At this point, we can conclude that evangelism is the proclamation of truths found in the Bible, truths which form a logical system, part of which system is the gospel. The gospel is not accounts of our personal experiences, nor commands that we are to obey. We now know what the gospel is. It is the good news of what Christ did for his people 2,000 years ago. It is not about the new birth, nor about the second coming, nor the activities of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. The gospel is propositions about events wholly outside of us. It has consequences and implications for us today, but those consequences are effects of the gospel, not to be confused with the gospel itself. The fatal error of the Middle Ages was to confuse justification with sanctification and so pervert the gospel. The same error is widespread among so-called Protestants today who do not distinguish between what Christ has done for us and what the Holy Spirit can do in us. We are rapidly re-entering the Dark Ages because the light of the gospel has been lost. Clarity of thought is a virtue in both evangelism and apologetics. Let us turn next to the, let us turn next to the word faith. We are so accustomed to using the word in a subjective sense today that we frequently overlook how the Bible uses the word. Let me quote a few references to faith in the Bible. And the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily, through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. Receive one who is weak in the faith. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith, which he once tried to destroy. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. We are so accustomed to thinking of faith as a subjective act that we forget that the Bible very frequently does not use the word in that sense at all. The word faith in the Bible frequently has an objective meaning. It means doctrine, knowledge, the propositions believed. In other passages, it means the act of believing those propositions. Nowhere in the Bible does faith mean what many 20th century Christians think it means, a subjective feeling or a heartfelt trust. When we speak about the defense of the faith or apologetics, we are using faith in the objective sense as the propositions believed, not the act of believing them. In this darkened 20th century, this objective sense of faith has also been lost. We are told that it doesn't matter what you believe so long as you are sincere. To use Kierkegaard's famous example, the idolater who prays with passionate inwardness is accepted by God even though he prays to an idol, while the professed Christian who prays insincerely to the true God is rejected by God. If you are not interested in the opinions of the 19th century Danish theologian, let me quote the great 20th century American theologian Dwight Eisenhower. Our government makes no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. Now this matter is not as humorous as it sounds. For many so-called conservative churches, as much as Kierkegaard and Eisenhower, belittle the importance of understanding, knowledge, and assent to the truth. They teach that trust is more important than knowledge, whatever trust is. And they claim that knowledge makes one arrogant, misquoting Paul, so that it is best not to have too much knowledge, if one has any at all. All that is important in this modern view is faith in a subjective sense. What that faith is in the objective sense of doctrines and propositions is unimportant. 
But that is not the teaching of the Bible. We are commanded to fight the good fight of faith, to hold fast the profession of our faith, and to contend for the faith. If our faith is not true, then we are of all men most miserable. Objective truth, not subjective feelings, is important in Christianity. Biblical faith, even in, in its subjective sense, does not refer to feelings, as the modern notion of faith does, but to the intellectual and volitional act of assenting to propositions. As the Westminster Confession of Faith says, the grace of faith, whereby the elect are enabled to believe, by this faith a Christian believeth to be true, whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein. Faith in the subjective sense is assent to the faith in the objective sense. Faith in the objective sense is the propositions of scripture and all that they imply. Faith is the system of truth contained in the Bible. Let's go on to the third word, which is defense. This brings us to our third word, defense. When we speak of defending the faith, we mean defending not only the gospel, but the whole counsel of God, all the propositions in the Bible, and all their implications. Before we go further, we must make clear that we do not mean that guns and coercion are to be used defending the faith, despite what some folks who would have us believe. Ideas cannot be defended by guns. To think that they can is to betray a fatal ignorance of the truth. Paul told the Corinthians, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I quote this paragraph from Paul for the benefit of any who might think that it is permissible to bomb abortion clinics, punish heretics with death, or support revolutionaries in foreign countries. Uh, it's 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. In this paragraph, Paul is explaining Christian apologetics. The weapons of the Christian are not material weapons, but intellectual weapons, that is, spiritual weapons. Our fight is not with guns and bombs, but with logic and truth. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Because our battle is intellectual, our weapons, both offensive and defensive, must be intellectual. We are commanded to put on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of Christ's righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, and the word of God. Christians, no matter how uneducated, must be intellectuals. We, all of us, are always supposed to be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks. How we are to answer requires a study of logic. The New Testament is replete with examples of how Paul, the other apostles, and Christ himself demolished arguments. Take, for example, the argument of the Sadducees that there is no resurrection. And I quote, The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven shall she be? For they all had her. The Sadducees obviously thought this was a conclusive argument against the resurrection. Let us pay attention to then what Christ says in reply. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Notice exactly what Christ does. He does not attack the Sadducees for using mere human logic. That, that's in quote. He does not attack them for being proud of their knowledge. He does precisely the opposite. He attacks these learned men for their ignorance and their mistakes in logic. You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Please remember, he criticized Nicodemus for the same reason, his ignorance.
Christ replies to their arguments by first correcting their ignorance of the state of the elect in heaven. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. Christ has already destroyed this particular argument of the Sadducees, for it was upon the logical impossibility of deciding whose wife this woman was that they concluded there could be no resurrection. Their argument is that the hypothesis of the resurrection leads to an absurd conclusion. Christ demolishes their argument by replying that she is nobody's wife. Obviously, if there are no wives in heaven, then the Sadducees' argument falls apart. So much for stage one of Christ's reply. He has shown that this specific argument does not refute the resurrection, but more is needed to refute the Sadducees thoroughly. While Christ has destroyed this one argument, perhaps the Sadducees have others that they will bring up later. So he goes on and does something more. He deduces the resurrection from two Old Testament propositions. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. God is the God of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead, but living. Therefore, there is a resurrection. Now, the Sadducees have no place to escape. Not only has their marriage argument collapsed, but their general position has been refuted by logical deductions from Scripture. Christ is more than a little sarcastic when he asked these men who were supposed to be teachers, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? In this example, we have a model of Christian apologetics, a model of how the faith is to be defended. First, Christ tells them that they were wrong. You are mistaken. Then he tells them why. You do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Third, he refutes their specific argument. Fourth, he refutes their general position by making logical deductions from Scripture. Is it any wonder, when Christ had finished his refutation of the Sadducees, that the multitudes were astonished at his teaching? The multitudes then may have been astonished at Christ's teaching, but some religious leaders today would be very angry. I am not speaking only of the neo-Orthodox who think that God is so different from us that we cannot conceive of him at all, nor am I thinking only of the liberals who think that thinking is merely rationalization and what counts is the feelings of the heart. There is also a very influential movement led by Cornelius Van Til of Westminster Seminary who feels that the use of logic is to be avoided in theology in general and in apologetics in particular. Mere human logic, to use a phrase often found in their writings, <coughs> is not to be trusted. So if dogs are four-legged animals and Rover is a dog, then Rover has six legs. And if God is the God of the living, and also the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then there is no resurrection and the Sadducees were right. Such an anti-logic position is certainly not the position of the Bible, and it certainly is not the position of Reformed theology. Let me quote from Benjamin Warfield's book, The Westminster Assembly and its work on this point. And this is a long quotation, but I'll go through it slowly so you catch what Warfield is saying. It must be observed, however, that the teaching and prescriptions of Scripture are not confined by the Westminster Confession to what is expressly set down in Scripture. Men are required to believe and to obey not only what is expressly set down in Scripture, but also what by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. If I may add an aside here, this contention is fully supported by the example I have cited. Christ reproached the Sadducees for not believing what could have been and should have been deduced from by good and necessary consequence from the Old Testament. To go on with the Warfield quotation. This is the strenuous and universal contention of Reformed theology against Socinians and Arminians, who desired to confine the authority of Scripture to its literal asseverations, its literal statements. And it involves a characteristic honoring of reason as the instrument for the ascertainment of truth. We must depend upon our human faculties to ascertain what Scripture says. We cannot suddenly abnegate them and refuse their guidance in determining what Scripture means. This is not, of course, to make reason the ground of the authority of inferred doctrines and duties. Reason is the instrument of discovery of all doctrines and duties, whether expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence deduced from Scripture. But their authority, when once discovered, is derived from God, who reveals and prescribes them in Scripture, either by literal assertion or by necessary implication. It is the Reformed contention, reflected here by the Confession, 
that the sense of scripture is scripture and that men are bound by its whole sense in all its implications. The re-emergence in recent controversies of the plea that the authority of scripture is to be confined to its expressed declarations and that human logic is not to be trusted in divine things is therefore a direct denial of a fundamental position of reform theology explicitly affirmed in the confession as well as an abnegation of fundamental reason which would not only render thinking in a system impossible but would discredit at a stroke many of the fundamentals of the faith such for example as the doctrine of the trinity and would logically involve the denial of the authority of all doctrine whatsoever booklet uh, you can quote him on either side of the issue you can quote him saying uh, you can prove god exists you can quote him saying you can't prove god exists you can quote him saying logic should be trusted you can quote him saying logic should not be trusted you can quote him saying god is three persons you can quote him saying god is one person uh, he's unique uh, you can't dismiss you can't call him a presuppositionalist and not explain what you mean simply because he says we can prove the truth of the bible uh, and the existence of god well that is not a presuppositional position but to get on with the uh, warfield here let me read that statement again because it's so important uh, to the situation in theology today and it's a long statement if you'll bear with me i think it uh, i think it deserves to be emphasized the re-emergence in recent controversies, now keep in mind that uh, Warfield wrote this almost a century ago, of the plea that the authority of scripture is to be confined to its expressed declarations and that human logic is not to be trusted in divine things, is therefore, and then he lists several things. Notice this list. First, it's a direct denial of a fundamental position of reformed theology explicitly affirmed in the confession as well as an abnegation of fundamental reason, that's the second thing, which would not only render thinking in a system impossible, but would discredit at a stroke many of the fundamentals of the faith, such as the Trinity, and would logically involve the denial of the authority of all doctrine whatsoever, since no single doctrine of whatever simplicity can be ascertained from Scripture except by use of the processes of understanding. The recent plea against the use of human logic in determining doctrine destroys at once our confidence in all doctrines, no one of which is ascertained or formulated without the aid of human logic. That is Warfield's position. That is the old Princeton position, and that is the position denied by the Vantillians. Doesn't even bring up the issue of presuppositions. It's the question of logic. Thus, the anti-logic position of the neo-orthodox and Ventilian schools is not new at all. It has been used by many heretical schools, from the Sadducees to the present day. They all are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Perhaps there is someone who thinks at this point that Christ's argument with the Pharisees is the only such argument to be found in scripture. Let me assure him that all the scriptural arguments can be put into logical form some more easily than others. Here are a few of the more obvious examples. John 8, 47. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. In symbolic logic, if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. He who is of God, if P, then Q, he will hear God's word. Therefore, you do not hear, not Q, because you are not of God, not P. Very simple. Logical form. Standard logical form. John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. If my kingdom were of this world, I'm rephrasing the argument, my servants would fight. My servants do not fight, therefore my kingdom is not of this world. Same logical form. If P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. My servants do not fight, therefore my kingdom is not of this world. John 9, 41. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. This verse is an excellent example of an ad hominem argument. In such an argument, one assumes, for the sake of argument, the position of one's opponent, 
That is precisely what Christ does here. He is teaching that responsibility is based on knowledge. If you were ignorant or blind, you would have no sin. But since the Pharisees did not claim to be ignorant, but to know, then they were sinful. Their very claim to know made them responsible. Ad hominem argumentation of this sort, assuming the opponent's position to point out its logical consequences, is one of the methods used in Christian apologetics. It is mentioned in Proverbs 6, 5, 26, 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. The other major, me- major method of apologetics is mentioned in Proverbs 26, 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. The first verse tells us to answer a fool according to Scripture, just as Christ did with the Sadducees. The second verse tells us to point out the logical implications of the fool's own views, just as Christ does with the Pharisees. Another example of Christ using an ad hominem argument is found in Matthew 12, verses 11 and 12. What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. The Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus by asking him whether it is lawful to heal on the Sabbath. He takes two premises, both of which they would agree with, that it is lawful to rescue a sheep in distress on the Sabbath, and that a man is more valuable than a sheep, and deduces from them that it is lawful to rescue a man in distress on the Sabbath. From their own views, Christ deduces the lawfulness of the action that they believed was unlawful, and then refutes them. What can you do with a man who is so adept at using logic? Only what the Pharisees did, and I quote, Then the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him how they might destroy him. Later in the same chapter, Christ sets up a syllogism to refute the Pharisees. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? The situation, as you recall, is the silent accusation of the Pharisees that Christ was casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Jesus, reading their minds, refutes the accusation. And this is the syllogism. All divided kingdoms cannot stand. If Satan casts out Satan, his kingdom is divided. Therefore, his kingdom cannot stand. Christ does not let the matter drop there. He has already demonstrated that by the Pharisees' own assumption, Satan's kingdom is being destroyed by Christ. But he goes on to drive the point home again, another practice that Christian apologists ought to imitate. It is not enough to demonstrate the absurdity of an attack on Christianity once or in only one way. It ought to be done repeatedly and in as many ways as possible. Christ engages in what delicate and squeamish people call overkill. After he has demolished his opponent's arguments once, he does it again for good measure. He continues, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. And if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Let's take a moment and unpack this argument. Christ is arguing that if he is casting out demons by the power of the devil, devil, then so were his disciples, the sons of the Pharisees. Is that what the Pharisees believed? He was forcing them to understand one of the implications of their accusation. If Christ was an agent of Beelzebub, then so were those who followed him, the young Jewish men he referred to as their sons. And if their sons were agents of Satan, then they would be a judgment to their fathers, the Pharisees. On the other hand, if Christ was who he said he was, then the kingdom of God has come, which the Pharisees vigorously denied. Either way, Christ argues, you lose. You will be judged for your unbelief. There are many more such examples that one could cite, but I believe you get the point. Logic is and must be the basic tool of Christian apologetics. It was so for Christ and the apostles, and anyone who belittles the usefulness or the lawfulness of logic is simply showing his unbelief or ignorance of Scripture. In addition to the Vantilians, there is a school of apologetics, the Evidentialists, which claims to be logical. Evidentialists are those who maintain that it is impermissible to appeal to Scripture without first having proved that Scripture is the Word of God. Of course, before that can be done, one must prove that God exists. 
Someone has remarked that an Arminian is never a Calvin, or an Arminian is never an Arminian when he prays. An Arminian always, or almost always, prays like a Calvinist. He doesn't say, God, I thank you for giving me a free will so that I could let Jesus into my heart and be saved. He says, he prays, merciful God, thank you for sending Christ to die on the cross to save me from my sins. Furthermore, he prays that God will cause other people to repent, forgetting for the moment his theology of free will. Undoubtedly, there are some Arminians who do not pray like Calvinists, but they seem to be relatively few. One Arminian evangelist, that is a contradiction in terms, of course, for an Arminian has no good news to tell. One Arminian preacher did tell his audience during the altar call not to pray, for it was too late. It was okay to pray before, and it would be okay to pray later, but right now the people who had come forward were on their own. They must exercise their own free wills, and even God could not help them. Just as most Arminians may pray like Calvinists, most evidentialists evangelize like presuppositionalists. How does an evidentialist evangelize? Why he goes out and he reads the Bible? He doesn't take the time to present Thomas Aquinas' five proofs for the existence of God, let alone read the first eight books of Aristotle's physics to his audience. He preaches the gospel. Of course, were he consistent with his theory of apologetics, he could not do so. According to that theory, one cannot appeal to God or the Bible without first establishing his existence and its truthfulness on the basis of principles that we know more certainly, principles such as sense experience. Providentially, God prevents the evidentialists from acting so foolishly. They start the same way the Bible starts, in the beginning God. There are no proofs of God's existence or the Bible's truthfulness offered. But while the evidentialists may be practical presuppositionalists when it comes to evangelism, they become completely confused when, when discussing apologetics. One recent example of this confusion is the volume of Classical Apologetics by John Gerstner, R.C. Sproul, and Arthur Lindsley. After attacking presuppositionalism, the three authors announced that they have three presuppositions, the law of contradiction, causality, and the reliability of the senses. But the confusion of the evidentialists extends much further. We have already understood that the faith to be defended is the propositions in the Bible. Christianity is not a way of life, nor a way of feeling, but a system of truth. But this causes some problems for the evidentialists. It means, for example, that the resurrection of Christ is a proposition to be defended. Yet many evidentialists, such as John Warwick Montgomery and R.C. Sproul, want to appeal to Christ's resurrection as evidence for the existence of God and the truthfulness of Scripture. But how do they, they know that the resurrection occurred unless God exists and the scriptures are his word? The resurrection is not a piece of evidence that they discovered through their senses or through scientific investigation and on which an argument for the existence of God or the truth of scripture can be hung. It is part of the propositional revelation itself. It is a deduction from the axiom of revelation. The Bible is the word of God. It is part of the system of truth. The evidentialists simply do not know what proves what. They assume what they say they are proving, the truthfulness of Scripture, in order to prove it. They argue in a circle. They beg the question. They excerpt propositions from Scripture and ignorantly attempt to use them to prove the inerrancy of Scripture. One can make the same point about miracles, fulfilled prophecy, and any other argument that the evidentialists derive from Scripture. They are supposed to be proving that the Scripture is true, but they first assume that it is true in order to prove that it is true. This method of argument is not sound but silly, and the world knows it. The evidentialists are as irrational in practice as the Vantillians say apologies should be. In neither the Vantillians nor the evidentialists, if neither the Vantillians nor the evidentialists can furnish a scriptural method of evangelism and apologetics, where does that leave us? It leaves us with the method of apologetics outlined by Gordon Clark. This method has been variously called Christian rationalism, dogmatism, presuppositionalism, and axiomatic theology. Undoubtedly, it has been called other things by people who dislike it but cannot refute it. But it is the method of Christ and the apostles, and it is the only method compatible with evangelism. Let me explain why. The method of evangelism and apologetics used by Christ and the apostles assumed the truth, the inerrancy of scriptures. That is where they began. Even when Paul preached to the Athenians, he used the word of God. His method in Acts 17 is particularly instructive. 
for he used several ad hominem arguments against the Athenians as well. These arguments are frequently called or confused with common ground arguments. Paul notes the Athenians altered to the unknown god and he begins there. He quotes from their own poets in order to embarrass them and prove his point. Since we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Their own poetry contradicted their idolatry, but their pro poetry is not sufficient to give them the truth. For that, Paul relies on the scriptures. He tells the Athenians that God created them, that he sustains all the creation, that all men were made by him from one man, that God has determined the pre-appointed times and boundaries of every people, that he will judge the world, that Jesus Christ was chosen by God and resurrected from the dead. All these propositions are from the Bible. Here you can see apologetics and evangelism in action. Paul refutes the idolatry of the Athenians by quoting one of their own poets. He shows the self-contradictory nature of Athenian religion. Then he tells them the truth, the biblical truth. The result is that some mocked Paul, but others said that they wanted to hear more. A few believed. Some benighted evangelists argue that Paul failed in Athens and therefore his method was wrong. He should have had thousands signing decision cards. But Paul knew that the result of his preaching was neither in his power nor the measure of the soundness of his method. His concern was to preach the whole counsel of God, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The results were in God's hands, not Paul's. Apollo's plants, Paul waters, but God gives the increase. One wonders what such pragmatic evangelists think of Stephen's sermon, uh, which got him killed, or Christ's first sermon, which almost got him killed when he was 30 years old. Neither man recorded thousands of decisions, yet both spoke exactly as they ought. In addition to, the assu to assuming the truthfulness of Scripture and using it as an axiom, Paul reasons with his hearers. Let me quote a few verses. Acts 17, 2 and 3. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Acts 18.4, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Acts 18.19, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, and he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Acts 24.24 24 and 25, and after some days, when Felix came with his wife Priscilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Notice the objective meaning of faith here. Now, as Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. In evangelism, it is the word of God that saves men, and by pressing home the meaning and the implications of the propositions in the Bible, as well as the implications of their hearers' opinions, that word is made more effective. The words that Christ speaks are life, and they give life. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. The Apostle James commands, Receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The appeal in both evangelism and apologetics is to the mind, not to the emotions of the hearers. The Bible emphasizes knowledge, not emotions as the means of both justification and sanctification. From our study of these verses, we can see that apologetics has two functions in relationship to evangelism. It softens up the opposition by pointing out the self-contradictory nature of non-Christian views. Second, it explains and elaborates on the propositions of Scripture by drawing out some of their logical implications. The job of apologetics is to ensure that Christianity, that is, the teaching of the Bible, will get a better hearing than it might otherwise receive. It does not attempt to prove the truthfulness of Scripture nor the existence of God. If anyone is interested in pursuing this thesis further, I can only urge him to study the works of Gordon Clark. There you will find explained in elaborate detail what a Christian is supposed to do when he preaches and when he explains the gospel. This, and not the performing of counterfeit miracles, is power evangelism. That's all. Yes, Mike. Um, the uh, earlier you mentioned about like sports and such, then we Calvin family was a serious affair with that small. Well, Calvin was did not do what many people think he did. Uh, he objected to the burning of Servetus. He went out of the head. Arguing that he ought to be they ought to be merciful and if they're going to kill him, do it in some other way. And uh, 
perhaps that uh, position would be uh, possible under the old covenant, but certainly not under the New Testament. We do not wage war as the world does, and we don't kill heretics. Yes. but I don't think that's uh, an evidentialist position. Um, of course we have to exercise judgment. Uh, if a document contradicts itself, it is obviously not God's word. Uh, logic is a negative test for truth. If, if a document says one thing in one place and directly contradicts it in another, then it cannot be God's word. And in using our minds and reading these alleged scriptures, the Apocrypha or whatever, uh, we have to keep that in mind. The Bereans are uh, congratulated by Paul for checking what he said, and he was a genuine prophet, not like the people we have running around on television today. Uh, he was a genuine prophet, and he commended the Bereans for checking everything he said against the written word. Now, to press it back further, what was the case before there was a written word? Uh, how did Adam know uh, that it was God speaking? Or how did Abraham know that it was God when he was told to kill Isaac? And to answer that question, uh, we simply, all we can say, since we're not told explicitly in the Bible, is that uh, God made sure that these people understood when he spoke to them that it was him speaking. But they did not have any external standard by which to judge this. Uh, Carnell, for example, uh, E.J. Carnell, once gave the idea of a moral anticipation that we know that it is God speaking because what he tells us is in agreement with what the law is that is already in our hearts. Well, how does that work in the case of Abraham? He has the law, do no murder, in his heart. And here God comes and tells him to kill his son. If I were to use Carnell's moral anticipation idea, uh, and if I were Abraham, I would never have taken any step to sacrifice Isaac. All we can say is that when God spoke to these men, that he made sure that they understood that it was him speaking. He caused them to think that this is God speaking. Now, when you get into the question of the Apocrypha, that's different. Then you have to read it and use the tools, that, uh, the mental and the intellectual tools uh, that were given to us. Of, Test of logic. No, I don't believe so. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Um, primarily because I think the first chapter of the confession takes care of any possibility like that. Uh, and that uh, that chapter is based upon the uh, present scripture itself. That there isn't anything. This, everything has been wholly reduced to writing. Uh, and that the text has been preserved over the centuries uh, by the providence of God. Uh, we certainly know that Paul wrote letters that we don't have. He says so himself. Uh, but they are not part of the canon. They have been, uh, we don't have them because they're not part of the canon. They're not part of scripture. And he tells us about them. Yes. Did you have a question? No, you. Oh, I was going to say, we, we ought not to ignore the, the work of the Holy Spirit in terms of what you talk about in Providence. I guess I'm speaking more personally. Working in men to use within the boundaries of the biblical logic to make decisions, and those decisions affect the church mm -hmm. for a long time. So we talk about Abraham, uh, or we talk about Adam. So the Spirit worked in those men 
correct in what you said that uh, anybody who trusts in good works is going to hell because they're disobeying Christ um, I think you know, it may have been imprudent to do it at the time you did it uh, I was working at the time and it seemed to be the only thing that could come to mind <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we're told and I, I, I think you were entirely right in doing it and we're told quite clearly in the Bible that if we tell the truth we're going to get uh, persecuted for it. Um, it says, uh, what disciple is better than his master? Uh, and if, if we would uh, have the courage and take the time to tell the truth more often, I think you'd see a lot more persecution of Christians in this country uh, than you do at the present time. The brothers. Well, that's that's... That is the most difficult thing. It, that is the most difficult thing. Is that when you get, uh, when, when you tell people, when you tell an unbeliever the truth and get called down for it by a fellow Christian. <laughs> Any other comment? Yes. No problem. Okay. I love the rigorousness of your mind. It's nice to run into somebody who I, I don't know if anyone actually, but but it's, I love to run into a brother who has a sense of the fact that God's truth is true. We don't need to be ashamed of that. We don't need to apologize for it. We don't need to, to cover ourselves and pretend that we're not really opinionated. So I appreciate that. And I like your comment with regard to the fact that our, our struggle is against principalities and powers and not flesh and blood. Because I've seen a lot of um, evangelical Orthodox churches there's, there's a uh, there's a leaking of the gospel because there's a stress on other things, be it abortion, which I'm partly against, or uh, be it political issues, or uh, dealing with local political issues, what have you. And if, though we as Christians ought to be concerned, I think, about the, our environment, yet I think that's a leaking of the gospel. I think that the result of a true preaching of the gospel is going to be uh, our right view of politics, or our right view of, of how our society has to I, I, I think you're entirely correct. If, if you look back on the history of Protestantism, uh, it's the theological reformation that comes first, and any political consequences come decades or centuries later. And that's the way it has to be. Uh, you cannot have a, a political reformation based on unbelievers um, or uh, an unbelieving society. It simply will not work. If we were to eliminate... Uh, nine of the uh, federal departments of government tomorrow or the Federal Reserve or whatever uh, it would be the day after tomorrow when they were put back in simply because the intellectual the spiritual base isn't there to sustain any uh, reformation like that and it's the theology is fundamental it comes first and even if you have uh, uh, even if you are interested in the political implications of it as I am or the economic implications of it you can't get the cart before the horse. You've got to take the theology first. Because that's the power. Christ was speaking in more senses than one when he said, uh, if you know the truth, the truth you may, will make you free. It certainly has a very profound theological meaning. But one can also apply it to politics. But without the theology, 
the politics are useless, futile. Uh, I have no, um, I have no great hope. Uh, maybe I'm stepping on your toes, Mike, but I have no great hope for the conservative movement in America, simply because uh, it is not made up of Christians, for the most part. Um, I published an essay on the subject ten years ago in which I pointed out that uh, conservatives, by and large, either are not Christians or uh, they do not uh, take their politics from the Bible. Uh, and in either case, you're working with dead wood. This concludes Dr. John W. Robbins' lecture entitled Evangelism and the Defense of the Faith.